Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Welcome to edition 107 of the Food Safety Fridays webinar program. Today's guest presenter is Maria Sandoval, microbiologist at Trace Analytics LLC. And the subject of today's webinar is micro microbial testing 101 for compressed air, understanding ISO 8573-7. Okay, so I'll, I'll, in, in a little while, I'll, I'll introduce you to Maria. Just a few things first. Um, the Food Safety Fridays webinar program is sponsored by Trace Analytics LLC, DMV GL Business Assurance, AIB International, Metal Toledo, and Safe Food 360. These kind of organizations support this program and help to bring uh, regular uh, little uh, short educations for you and you get the presentation slides, the recording and certificate of attendance, which we will send to you in an email afterwards. Hi. <laughs> uh, first off, I want to thank you all for attending this webinar. My name is Maria Sandoval, like Simon said. I'm the microbiologist here at Trace Analytics in Austin, Texas. Today we'll be discussing the fundamentals of microbial testing for compressed air and how it relates to ISO 8573-7 specifically. So let's go ahead and get started. Like Simon said, there'll be time at the end of the presentation for any questions that you may have. We can also open it up for discussion. So this webinar is gonna focus on these seven topics. First, I'll introduce you to why it's important to sample your compressed air for microbial contaminants. We'll walk through ISO 8573-7 and its requirements. I think often third-party labs assume microbial terminology is known to the sampling technicians using our equipment and consumables. So we'll definitely go over microbiology lingo in the terminology section. Um, how to sample using ISO 8573-7 appropriate equipment, which is the key. And then we'll take questions for anyone who has them. Please feel free to email me or call us. My number and my email is at the bottom of most of the slides. So often we associate the major utilities in our normal day life as electricity, gas, and water. But what I think we forget is how often the products we use have been in contact with compressed air. Compressed air is commonly referred to as the fourth utility because of its major utilization in behind the scenes packaging and preparation for food to pharmaceutical products. Some of you might have some really great examples of compressed air used in the direct contact manner. The best one that I could think of are air knives blowing off the potato skins of your favorite crisps and fries to blowing off excess liquid and batter. But also don't forget, compressed air is used to sort pharmaceutical pills during production and cleaning off prosthetics during manufacturing. Another important type of use is indirect contact, and this is using compressed air to blow open product bags, clean conveyor belts, and move products or blowing off floors near packaging areas. So really when you stop and think, compressed air is everywhere and essentially touches almost every product we consume and buy. The next leap of thought should be, well, how do we monitor its cleanliness? And thanks to international and national entities, there exist protocols for testing compressed air that allow your facility's environmental health and safety department the ability to track trending analysis of the microbial loads. <clears throat> However, having a monitoring plan is only as good as the protocol itself. Case in point, in 2014, Parker Hannafin Corp. released a case study that investigated a bakery that sent their compressed air micro microbiology samples to a lab for an analysis. The samples came back with a microbial count too high for the facility's in-house limits. So the next logical step that they took was to clean the point of use and install new air filtration systems and retest. But again, another micro report with results above the in-house limits occurred. So at this point, if you're in the testing department for that bakery, you're starting to sweat. The filters are adequate, they're new, the testing lab is accredited, but your boss is asking, where is this contamination coming from? So then the bakery in conjunction with the testing lab found out the contamination was due to a flaw in the actual sampling, sampling method. The bakery was mixing environmental air or ambient air, whichever you choose, and the compressed air by failing to use an appropriate procedure for sampling compressed air. 
They did this by blowing compressed air in the open bakery directly onto the microbiology contact plate and not inside an enclosed piece of equipment. This is one case study where understanding why we're seeing contamination can alter your method of testing. So I want you to think for a moment the types of methods you've maybe seen that seem like they might be inadequate. I'll give you an example. Another one that I've heard of is where um, sampling technicians will spray their compressed air onto a semi-sterile or sanitized surface and then stamp their contact plate onto that area of the surface that they just blew their air onto in hopes that that's an adequate way of testing their compressed air. In fact, that's not. Another um, method that I've heard about is the contact air bag method where you put a contact plate or a Petri dish inside of a sterile bag and then you blow compressed air into that bag in hopes that whatever contamination may be in your compressed air will somehow make contact with that plate while it's whipping around in your sterile bag. So that's also an inadequate way of testing. <clears throat> So there are typically three potential sources of true contamination in your compressed air samples. Uh, one, the ambient or environmental air is drawn inside the intake compressor, not filtered or inadequately filtered. Microorganisms are small, hence the name micro. So you need to make sure that your filters are adequate for the size of microbiological particles. And you can definitely do that um, by contacting your compressed air service provider and asking for recommendations for the types of filters that they use for your type of compressed air system. It's all different, so it all needs to be dependent on the system that you have. Um, appropriately sized air filtration systems to filter out contaminants is important. Air dryers, which you can discuss with your compressed air service provider again, should all be employed if you're having issues or not hitting your benchmark. Two. Mechanical compression process can lead to particle and oil contaminants. So some of my colleagues are actually um, on this live chat right now. So if you have any issues with that, you can definitely contact them. I think Rubio Cho is on here. Um, three, piping distribution and air storage tanks. Do you have the appropriate piping preventative maintenance that monitors the inhibition of bacterial biofilms? All some microorganisms need to thrive is warmth, water, and nutrients. And if you have moist, compressed air because it's not dry, over a warm engine and inadequate filtration, you're at a higher risk of microbial contamination. So these are the types of instances that you need to be looking into when you're doing preventative maintenance or looking for contaminant sources. This is also why a proper protocol that has been vetted by a committee of experts to monitor your compressed air properly is so important. So this committee that I'm referring to is the ISO committee that's written an entire standard and protocol for testing and sampling compressed air. ISO 8573-7 is a nine part standard. Today we'll only be looking at part seven. That's my uh, microbiology part. But in the past, my colleagues here at Trace have done IFSQN webinars on particles, water, and oil sections as well. If you want to check those out a little bit later. Um, so let's look at part seven and address microbial testing. So briefly, uh, these are the meat and potatoes of ISO 8573-7. You have the required and suggested protocols or normative and informative. You're required to use a septic technique, which we'll go into in a little bit, and you need negative control plates that prove the sampling technician and supplier of your micromedia didn't contribute to any contamination before or after the sample of the point of use was taken. So it might seem excessive to have one before and after, but this is just giving you confidence that if you do have growth on your point of view sample that it wasn't contributed to any other outside factor. Normative procedures are required of the test method. And if you have the protocol on you, uh, they're in steps Annex B on page five of the actual protocol. The terminology in the protocol uses words like shall for requirements, should and may for highly recommended steps. But if you do use those, you shall follow them. So just keep in mind of the terminology of this protocol. 
Listed here are the five shalls of the method. You need to start with disinfected method approved compressed air microbial impaction equipment. And again, we'll go over that a little bit later in the talk. You have to have controls for each point of use. The terminology in the normative procedure calls these controls blind test before and blind test after. You must label the plates so the laboratory can appropriately report your results to the matching point of use. The outer edge of the plates shall be free from colonies. That refers primarily to the aseptic technique requirement. And last but not least, you need a true negative control that has never been opened by your sampling technician, but has traveled the distance of your plates, incubated with your plates, and has no observable growth. There's no name for it in the actual protocol, but we call it a, a trace here, a sterility blank. And, and also, and not listed here, you need to have a 10 to 14 day incubation period where every 24 hours the plates are analyzed and documented. And that's it, it's not too bad. It's not much of a protocol in terms of the requirements. So it should be very feasible for, for most facilities to do. In Annex A, C, and D of the method, uh, these are the informative procedures. The method states they are suggestions, but as always, if anything of the informative sections are followed, they shall be followed entirely. Annex A is the suggested report layout for the data. Annex C is an additional sampling measure for endotoxins. And Annex B is preparation of sampling media. Endotoxins are typically secondary metabolites that um, microorganisms produce as a waste product sometimes. So that's what an endotoxin is. But no matter, but no matter what, you have to employ a septic technique when you're sampling for microbiological contaminants, whether it's environmental or compressed air. So what is a septic technique? It's making sure you, the sampling technician, does not cross-contaminate your compressed air micro sample. It will save you money from incurring retesting costs due to false positives. A false positive due to not using a septic technique is usually a glove print from the edge of the auger surface. So let's discuss how aseptic technique and personal protective equipment or PPE get along together. You can't have one without the other. If your PPE like gloves or lab coat is dirty, then you aren't in compliance with proper basic aseptic technique for sampling. If you aren't wearing PPE, then you aren't using aseptic technique. This bulleted list is a great start point for what you should look for when you're sampling or training someone to sample. So why gloves? Your hands have what's called normal microbial flora. It's a fancy term for your hands are contaminated with flesh loving microbes. Protect your compressed air sample from them <laughs> by wearing clean gloves. Gloves are only as good as you keep them clean. So no nose picking or face rubbing. Rub them down with greater than or equal to 70% ethanol or isopropanol is a really great way of disinfecting them before you sample. But again, clean lab coats so you don't unintentionally dirty your gloves or get your skin cells all over your compressed air sample. Face masks so you don't sneeze on your compressed air sample even talking over an exposed microbial plate for an extensive period of time can result in cross-contamination. You get the idea. You're a walking contaminated Petri dish. We're trying to save your compressed air samples from so you don't have to retest or get false positives. If you have any questions regarding aseptic technique, you can definitely give me a call. I can talk you through it. Um, you can also even go to YouTube, and there are a bunch of facilities that can walk you through aseptic technique. Um, but seriously, save yourself the money and use aseptic technique and proper PPE when you're using any microbiological media. It will save you time and money. So when you do decide to go ahead and test using ISO 8573-7, you'll receive a purchase microbial testing media. This media, for people who aren't familiar with it, usually looks like um, yellowish or any other color, really jello inside of a small circular casserole dish or petri dish and it needs to be stored at the recommended storage temperature it's imperative to making sure that the organisms you have 
or may not have in your compressed air have a fighting chance of growing in the incubator. So you have to store this media properly. If you don't, you can alter the nutrients. You can alter the way the organism can grow. So it's really important to pay attention to the storage requirements. Never, ever, ever freeze agarose. Most media will state you need to store it at room temperature or refrigerated temperature. So just keep in mind of that. Room temperature is really important. Room temperature is a generic term for plus or minus a few degrees off of 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Room temperature is not 98 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. It is always plus or minus 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So keep that in mind when you see that. Too hot and the media will melt. It's a gelatinous base, so melting happens. And if that does, the sampling, um, before the sampling occurs, the media may not sit properly in the base of the Petri dish. And so once sampling has occurred, you have to either incubate right away if you have an in-house lab, or you have to refrigerate the sample to inhibit uncontrolled microbial growth before the testing lab can receive it. So now let's discuss what a control is for ISO 8573-7. They term it a blind sample, but essentially it's a media sample that removes the variable being tested. In this case, you're testing compressed air, all the while keeping the other aspects the same. Pictured here are two agarose contact plates. The one on the left is a compressed air impaction sample where air impacts the surface of the media. And this is proof that the air came in contact uh, with the plate. And so basically that's what an impaction sampler means. The air has impacted the media and now you get this dimpling effect. If you don't see that, then you're having some issues. And the image on the right is of a control blind. So no dimpling or cuts or contamination are indication that the blind was collected appropriately. ISO 8573-7 does not have compressed air microbial limitations. It's important that you know that, but it does have specifications for controls. There shall not be growth on the blinds, but if the compressed air isn't coming in contact with the blind, how does growth occur? So as we addressed earlier, lack of aseptic technique is the leading cause of false positives and contamination to the blind samples and often the outer edge of any sample plate. Now, if your facility is testing to ISO 8573-7 standards, retesting might be required if your EHS or QAQC department have written that in your specific monitoring plan. Seconds of cleaning your gloves with ethanol or IPA can save you potential retesting fees. Most of this all happens because of protocol breakdown. People get lazy or they get tired or they're sampling at the end of the day or maybe it's hot in your facility. Whatever the reason is, lack of aseptic technique can be a potential source of contamination. Leaving the plates out in the environment air too long, like the case study suggested, and proper sampling technique, these are all types of pitfalls. So you want to try to avoid those at all costs. So this is a generic image of what your before blind point of view sample and after blind can look like if it's properly tested. Now, obviously, don't panic. If you have this much growth on your point of view sample, you have some major, major compressed air system contamination. But notice the blinds are contamination free. This allows you and the facility to have a high level of confidence that the contamination is a true positive because your before and after blinds are free of microorganisms. So this gives you the, the, the leeway to make that leap of judgment. Yes, I need to close the plant. Yes, I need to retrain my people. Yes, I need to do these things. But if you have contamination on your blinds, it's harder for you to have any kind of confidence of whether or not where the contamination came from. So keep that in mind. Like I mentioned earlier, there exists a control that is not named in the normative procedure. It's just merely described. It's a type of negative control. It's a Petri dish or contact plate that's not open and tests the sterility of the plate as it travels from manufacturer, distributor, testing facility, testing lab, and through each of your transit modes 
to report. So like FedEx or UPS or your postal service. This plate should not be open, but what it should be is kept with you at all times during sampling and shipment. There's also a limitation to this plate in ISO 8573-7. There can be no growth on this plate. If there is, there's a possibility since remember, this plate was never opened. You never opened it. And that plate might be compromised somehow, either at the distributor or at the testing facility, or maybe there was a hole in the bag when you got it. So that's why the sterility blank is so important. So again, this is the important journey your little sterility blank goes through. Um, you want to make sure that there isn't un any unintentional contamination along the way. We get a lot of questions um, of why the sterility blank is so important or why they need to provide it. And if you are following ISO 8573-7, it's important because this is another way for you to have confidence in the microorganism um, samples that you might be receiving on your point of use. So this is the way it'll go. You'll have your um, manufacturer through transit to your uh, distributor, back down to the facility and to your testing lab. So next we'll be discussing terminology you'll run into, either in equipment instructions, data sheet instructions, or the ISO 8573-7 report itself. So, excuse me, we'll go through some terminology here. So colony forming units are the number of microbes in a single collective that grow on agarose medium. Pictured here, you can see this plate has been incubated for the required 10 days. In the 10 days, four colonies have appeared. The size of the colony does not change the number of the colony. A colony can be hundreds or thousands of single-celled bacteria or yeast. Molds in ISO 8573-7 are also reported as CFU, even though they're multicellular eukaryotes. They're reported as CFUs. So you can see here on day 3-4, you have one CFU. Day 5-6, you have four CFUs popping up, and all the way to day 9 to 10, it's still the same four, even though they've grown, right? Bacteria, yeast, they grow exponentially, so they're still considered single colonies. So how are CFUs reported? They can be reported as CFU per plate or CFU per cubic meter. A cubic meter is equivalent to 1,000 liters. So often it's in terms of 1,000 liters of air sampled onto the media. So when you see that um, CFU per cubic meter, you can make the logical leap that it is an actual air sample. If you see CFU per plate on your report, you can make the leap that it's there was no air in contact of the plate. So... Aerobic bacteria versus anaerobic bacteria. I'm going to talk about this um, for a second. Uh, it's not mentioned in ISO 8573-7, but I do want you to be familiar with it. So aerobic bacteria thrive and require the presence of oxygen to reproduce, like compressed air. So that's perfect example. Organisms that can live in your compressed air are typically aerobic bacteria. However, anaerobic bacteria require the absence of oxygen. And if you're interested in knowing if you're compressed nitrogen as contamination in the storage tank, you may want to send your plates to the testing lab in an anaerobic environment for anaerobic analysis. And all of this can be done by a testing lab. They can send you these cute little anaerobic pouches. They're super easy to use. Um, all you have to do is just tell your testing lab that you want to do that. Um, can you think of another type of gas that's used? Um, maybe, maybe argon, right? Argon's often used as well as nitrogen for modified atmosphere packaging. Argon's typically used because it's a heavier gas than nitrogen. So if you're going to put argon, say, in potato chip bag, it'll blanket your potato chips a little more efficiently than, say, nitrogen. But it's all up to you. And also, either gas can be tested anaerobically as well. You can also test the gases aerobically, but remember, if you're trying to figure out what the microbial uh, contaminants are inside of the storage tank, then you want to try to replicate that environment as closely as you can 
And by doing that, you need to have an environment that's as close to the one that that organism likes. And in this case, it would be an anaerobic environment. Whereas compressed air, right, storage tank has a bunch of oxygen in it. So it's fine to have a run-of-the-mill aerobic sample. And that is typically just a bare film Petri dish. Um, that That's fine. ISO 8573-7 has some requirements on the type of media you choose. The normative procedure or the required procedure requires non-selective media to be examined for 10 to 14 days every 24 hours. Non-selective media is a broad spectrum medium like triptych soy auger. Select selective medias are like the ones suggested in Annex D of the informative procedures like SDA, Sauberon dextrose auger. Um, you don't have to try to spell that out. You can just do SDA if you're interested in it, and uh, that'll pop up, which selects for fungi specifically, fungi being yeasts and molds. This means bacteria will not grow on that specific media. Another type of media, and every vendor's favorite to market, are differential medias. Essentially, the organism or the media changes colors depending on the selected property. So check this out real quick. Here's a fun little image of some of the examples um, illustrating the types of media. So here on the left is broad spectrum, also known as non-selective. Uh, it's something like triptych soy auger, nutrient auger, things like that. Uh, you can see here that somebody put a handprint on there and you can see all the lovely normal flora that is on your hands. Maybe they stuck their hand in dirt. Here's hoping they stuck their hand in dirt before they did this. Um, the next media, is selective. So the, this is going to be what your SDA looks like, what your MEA looks like, uh, MEA being malt extract others. Um, and that's selective for fungi specifically. And there are some other plates that are also selective for specific organisms if you want to look into that as well. And the one on the far right is the real adorable differential media. And so you can see at the top, somebody wrote out E. coli and E. coli. And because of its metabolic properties, E. coli is turning pink. Uh, Klebsiella, which is a coliform, so is E. coli, is turning purple here. Proteus mirabilis, uh, it's a swarmer, which is why it looks kind of uh, fuzzy around it, but that's also turning yellow, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea of why these medias look a little bit different. So sometimes you'll receive media that have shorthand on the sides. In this case, if you're getting any media from us, sometimes you see a TR soy, which is triptych soy containing auger that contains lecithin and tween, both of which are neutralizers for cleaning reagents. Uh, some of these cleaning reagents that it can neutralize are bleach and isopropanol, uh, ethanol, things like that, hydrogen peroxide. And the ICR indicates the particular media is good for isolators and clean rooms. So we typically send out, if you're in the food industry, which you guys probably are, um, we typically send out triple bag media. And that's also adequate for clean rooms and isolators like pharmaceutical requirements have. ISO 8573-7 dictates that you must incubate for 10 to 14 days checking on your plates every 24 hours. Now, here at Trace, um, we've done some investigation for peer-reviewed studies, and it supports the double temperature incubation periods. 33 degrees Celsius incubation is not only around the temperature of the human body, but it's also about how warm it is inside of a compressor engine at times. Ideally, what you want to do is replicate the conditions that the suspected organism will grow in best, so if, the, so if the microbe is present, it will grow. And 25 degrees Celsius is ambient temperature and what's typically best suited for fungi or mesobacteria. Um, this is not mentioned in ISO 8573-7, but I do want to talk about it for a little bit and I'll mention it again towards the end of the talk. But often you'll be asked, when you're preparing to order test analysis, whether or not you want your bacteria classified as gram positive or gram negative. This is done by gram staining. Um, it's a procedure that utilizes four reagents to properly identify the cell wall component of most bacteria. 
To give you an idea, E. coli, which is everyone's reason for not eating romaine lettuce this Thanksgiving in the United States, is uh, gram negative. Staphylococcus epidermidis is gram positive and exists all over your skin. It's part of your uh, normal flora. And a little later, we'll touch on why you may want a gram stain before you spend the money to molecularly identify your compressed air microbes. So if you do choose to gram stain, you'll get reports that say gram negative rod or gram positive caucus. These refer to microscopic morphologies, while yellow and flat refer to macroscopic analysis. Some rods can contain endospores, which are small suitcases of important genetic information packed away for that microbe that can have pathogenic consequences if ingested. But I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but I'm pointing at the little uh, number nine. So that would be macroscopically described as flat and yellow and microscopically described as caucus, right? And if it was gram stained and it came back gram positive, it would be gram positive caucus. So that gives you an idea of the type of microorganism it is. Remembering E. coli is gram negative rod. So a rod does not look like a spherical caucus organism. TNTC, or too numerous to count, um, is a number of microorganisms that exceeds 250 colony forming units, which will require immediate attention if your compressed air truly has this and the blinds are clean. But for most testing labs, things on the left where it says countable will be counted and reported out to you. For things on the right, most testing labs will say greater than 250 CFU per cubic meter and send that report out to you. So now that you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into, you need to pick the appropriate piece of equipment to sample. ISO 8573-7 requires an impaction sampler that's qualified. That's the key word. This impaction sampler has to be qualified and validated for reporting quantitative results. This requires reading the fine print. Some of the lightest and affordable piece of, pieces of equipment out there are not capable of reporting quantitative reports. They can report qualitative. That's a presence or absence, but that's it. So here are a few examples on the market today. Here at Trace, we use the SAS Pinocchio Super 2 kit, but Trio Boss and Eppendorf have their um, versions as well. Again, this equipment is not the same as an ambient or environmental air tester. That's different. So you'll see some of these have attachments at the top, but um, that's a little bit different from the ambient and environmental air sampler. So when you're ready, you need to pick your media. Non-selective or does your microbial plan require a plate that investigates only yeast and mold? That's something that you're going to have to look into, particularly in your own monitoring plan. In which case, if you do need one that investigates only yeast and mold, like we discussed earlier, you can look at SDA or MEA, um, and those are suggested in the informative protocol. Whereas non-selective media is the requirement uh, in the normative protocol. And here at Trace, we use triptic soy auger, um, but you can also use like nutrient or plate count. Okay, so let's assume you finish sampling and you're ready to ship it off to your third party lab. Let's look at the major hiccups that can result in you retesting. Remember, all inoculated media or media that has been sampled on has to be kept refrigerated while in transit to inhibit uncontrolled microbial growth. Use the bubble wrap to protect your plates from bulky ice packs. All of this is important. Uh, they're not going to treat your box like it's a baby. They're going to kick it off a conveyor belt. So you need to make sure that your plates are properly protected. So definitely use bubble wrap around your plates. Use the desiccant provided to eliminate any moisture around your plates during transit. Um, and if you're shipping, uh, make sure that you ship next day. Uh, it's required, especially in the summer here in Texas, it gets really hot. And I know in other places it gets hot as well. Um, 
that transit in and of itself can act as an incubator. So you need to have frozen ice packs. You need to make sure that it's a next day shipment. So these are all the things you want to do. If you have to have a shipment that's longer than 24 hours, you need to make sure that you have a cold chain um, thermometer inside of there that can track the temperature. So you know that your plates didn't go above or below the recommended uh, shipping temperature. All right, stay with me. We're almost done. Um, let's look at the information the ISO 8573-7 report gives you. ISO 8573-7 requires that your report be in CFU per cubic meter units. That's fine. You have some options. Sometimes you can't, for whatever reason, reach a flow rate of 100 liters per minute to test for 10 minutes. You can use this basic math equation here on the right to figure out what liters per minute or LPM you can reach for the calculated time required to sample 1,000 liters of air. Or you can sample less than 1,000 liters of air and have to extrapolate the CFU counts for 1,000 liters by multiplication. Uh, reminder, we're not holding on to your plates forever on purpose. ISO 8573-7 requires a 10 to 14 day incubation period. But I do want to remind you, if you're going to do this extrapolation, I mean, it's not real, right? It's a, it's a version of multiplication. So it's more ideal to get a real value for a thousand liters sampled. So my recommendation is test a thousand liters. Our equipment has been validated for a hundred liters per minute, tested at 10 minutes, which equals a thousand liters sampled. But again, it's up to your monitoring plan. So there's no specifications for compressed air microbial testing. There are limits for ambient air and environmental contact surfaces, but not compressed air. But should you choose to use ISO 8573-7, remember, there are requirements. You cannot have growth on your blinds or sterility blank. ISO 8573-7 only asks you to report colony enumeration, which is colony counts, or how many microbes are in a thousand liters of your compressed air or gas. But I'm, if you're a facility, don't you want to have more information than that? Don't you want to know what is in your air, not just that you have something in your air? So gram staining can help you start the identification process of your microbes. Maybe it can even save you money. <clears throat> if your house, if your in-house requirement is to verify that any CFU present in your compressed air is not E. coli or salmonella or any other indicator pathogen, it can be more cost effective to gram stain first before you absorb the cost of molecular identification. A gram negative rod like E. coli will never look like a gram positive caucus like staph. Gram staining can also identify whether or not your organisms have spores, which can be highly resistant to cleaning reagents and also pathogenic. So keep that in mind. But should you need to know if gram-negative rods is a good guy or a bad guy, the only way to do it with 100% certainty is to use molecular techniques to determine identification. There's a bunch of different pieces of equipment out there that do that. There's the Vitec, Malditovs, they've got PCR and RT-PCR. So you have a barrage of um, options out there if you want to do molecular identification. <clears throat> So what did we discuss today? ISO 8573-7 2003 is the international method for sampling compressed air for microbial contaminants. It requires a septic technique, negative controls like blinds. You at minimum are required to report CFU enumeration per cubic meter. And you have the options um, with any testing lab to do gram staining or molecular ID. I do want to point out that December 19th is December 19th is the last day to submit a vote of confirmation on ISO 8573-7. The ISO committee is actually going to be reviewing its standard for the test methods for microbiological contamination content. Uh, so if you're interested in putting in feedback or if you're interested in making changes or anything like that, 
go ahead and go online to ISO. You can join the uh, CAGI committee and there's a systematic review of ISO 8573-6 and 8573-6 now. So just keep that in mind. All right. So with that, uh, thank you again for your attention. And I'll take any questions now. Great. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, excellent presentation. And ladies and gents, you'll get a copy of the slides and the recording. If you want to switch your uh, webcam on, uh, Maria, we'll come back on webcam. Yeah, um, everybody will get a copy of the slides and the recording um, afterwards. So thanks, Maria, again. And uh, we'll, let's, should we pick through the questions now? Yeah, sure. Okay, first one from Eb, Eb. What do you think about collecting compressed air through a jar with sterile water and then analyze the water? So like I mentioned earlier, um, all right, this is a little bit of a two-part question. If you want to adhere to ISO 8573-7, that's not going to work. That's not a approved impaction sampler uh, method. Also, that's not the Part 7 method. Uh, secondly, there is a uh, informative method in there that is similar to um, what you're discussing. It's basically taking a little bit of the... Uh, filled the dried air from your desiccator and sampling that for endotoxins. It's similar to that, but that is not actually something that I would recommend doing. Sterile water is also not a very good nutrient media, so that's my okay. suggestion. Okie dokie. Uh, next question from Michael. Is potato dextrose agar PDA the preferred agar for air testing? So PDA is a uh, yeast and mold specific nutrient plate. So if you're looking for yeast or molds, then you can definitely use PDA. But if you're going to want to do a, a non-selective media, like a broad spectrum, you want to, like I said, stay with nutrient, TSA, plate count, things like that. But if you're looking for specifically yeast and mold, then PDA is is okay, but I would recommend SDA or MEA over PDA personally. Okay, and just remind us what those other two, the um, full... So uh, PDA is specific, so the one that Michael's talking about here is specific for yeast and mold. SDA is Sauberon dextrose auger. It's also specific. It's a selective media for yeast and mold. It will not grow bacteria. And MEA is malt extros, malt extract auger and it's specific for um yeast and mold as well well done <laughs> uh vicky by looking at the plates every day is there potential to affect the final counts for example if there is mold moving the plate mold moving the plate around could dislodge spores those land elsewhere on the plate and grow as a new colony so that's a really great question, Vicki. So what we do here at the testing lab, well, first let's back up through the transition of your plate, right? So you're sampling your plate. If you're doing it right, you're putting it in a refrigerated area so that yeast, mold, bacteria are inhibited until it gets into your incubator. All right, so now it's in the incubator. And this is a really valid question. So most labs will keep their plates on a tray and using aseptic technique, this is part of a microbiology laboratory. You want to transfer those plates gently. And you have to caveat that. What is gently, right? Gently to me may not be gently to someone else. But you have to know that you're not tossing your plates down. Spores are extremely sensitive. But from what I see, it's standard practice. Uh, your plates are parafilmed. When they're incubated, that keeps the moisture in. It keeps extraneous um, detritus out of the inside of your plate. So you should be protected from that. Okay. Uh, VJ, what is the pressure needed to be used for collecting samples? <clears throat> so that's really dependent on your OEM, your original equipment manufacturer. 
Um, here at Trace, like I said, we use the Pinocchio Super 2, and ours is validated at 60 PSI um, from your point of use. So anything beyond that could damage our sampler. Um, you can go under that, but 60 PSI is typically what we do. And then, so that's pressure, and then you want to do 100 liters per minute, and that's flow rate. So try not to confuse the two. Okay, Monique, um, I'm not sure if you've already covered this. Do you have any specific equipment you would recommend? Yeah. Hey, Monique. Um, I definitely would recommend first looking at the OEM um, validations, right? So like I said earlier in the talk, there are pieces of equipment that are not validated to do qualitative analysis. They can do – or that are, yeah, they can do, no, flip that. They're not, they're equipment that can't do quantitative, they can only do qualitative. Uh, so pay attention to that when you're investigating what type of equipment. I'm going to be uh, biased here and say buy the Pinocchio Super 2. Um, but there are also other uh, pieces of equipment that are validated as ISO 8573 appropriate impaction samplers. Very good. Uh, VJ, again, what is the quantity ML of media needed for this technique? So that's dependent on the size of the plate that you're using. So um, 90 millimeter standard Petri dish plates are around, what, 120 mils? Um, and 55 millimeter uh, plates, which are what we use, are a little bit less than that. Okay, this is a bit of a longer one, so bear with me, um, Maria. Hopefully you can see it, but I will read it. From Vicky, what is the impact on the agar plate the longer you pull the sample? For example, one minute versus three minutes, or 100 litres or 1,000 litres? I think that's a litre, I don't know. Does the plate dry out? Should the plate be poured thicker? We know that microbial growth is influenced by available water. So does the water stroke moisture of the plate impact the count? Okay, long question. Here we go. Um, <laughs> what's the impact on the auger plate the longer you pull out the sample? So that was actually an experiment we had our summer intern do. Uh, basically, if you're going to sample for one minute versus three minutes or one minute versus 10 minutes at 100 liters per minute, you're going to see a lessening of the dimpling effect on the surface of your contact plate. But it's all dependent on how much air you want to sample, right? ISO 8573-7 wants you to sample 1,000 liters. It wants you to report a cubic meter, which is 1,000 liters. So it's best to sample a thousand liters but if you can't do that again you can extrapolate but the only uh, morphological difference from the plate itself is that the dimpling is a little bit less but it still will be there if you don't have dimpling on an impaction sampler chances are there was something that went wrong along the way uh, the next part is uh, does the plate dry out so um, that was also something that I had the intern do. And it turns out that the plate itself does not dry out. Even if you have um, a desiccator, there's enough moisture on the contact plate for it to handle the validated time um, required for your piece of equipment. So that's, that's the IQPQ that goes into your actual uh, equipment. So you want to try to stay within the validation studies of the equipment that you're using. Um, we know that microbial growth is influenced by available water. And again, the plates, they come, I don't know if you're familiar with them, um, Agaros plates are pretty moist, which is why if you don't use proper aseptic technique, that moisture can wick the microbes from your dirty gloves and cause um, outer ring contamination on your plate. So that's why everything is super strict when it comes to aseptic technique and sampling for microbial contamination. Okay, thank you. Um, from Rohit, what is the ac acceptance limit for cosmetic manufacturing plant? 
Oh. Okay, so that's a little specific. That's not something that I can go into right now. Um, I'll have somebody uh, definitely write that question down. But again, I want to remind you, there are no specification limits for microbial contamination in compressed air. Now, you can caveat that by saying, if you want to look at some of the pharmaceutical requirements, um, there is a really beautiful sentence that says your compressed air must at least be under the environmental contamination in the area that your point of use is being sampled from. I mean, that's essentially all that's out there for limitations. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, Monique, how do you prevent the colonies from growing on the edge of the plate? You have clean gloves. I swear to you. If you just <laughs> clean your gloves, it will never happen to you. But you've got to do it. And your gloves have to fit properly. You have to wear the appropriate size. If you have these baggy fingers, they're just going to just walk right on top of your auger plate and just contaminate everything. Maria's microbial tip of the day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, Dustin, does SQF requirement for air testing have to be compliant with the ISO standard? I cannot find guidance. Yeah, it's a really good question. I can't find guidance either. Um, yeah, so all SQF asks, again, is that it's under, is that it's tested, for one, and that it's at least under the environmental ambient air colony counts. Um, but ISO standard is the international standard for testing compressed air. And it, I'm circling the question because there is no specification. Okay. Uh, Lady Bayon, uh, what types of microorganism is recommended for compressed air testing? Aerobic and yeast and mold are good options. Should we test before and after replacing the filter? Well, you do not want to introduce microorganisms into your compressed air, that's for sure. Um, maybe the question is what types of microorganisms, microorganisms you can find in compressed air. Um, you can find anything, really. It's all dependent on the environment. It's all dependent on the location of your compressed air tank. So there's a, it was a webinar that I watched myself and a guy had a story about the compressed air intake was outside and there were some birds nesting above the roof and the bird droppings were dropping near the intake and that is what was contaminating their uh, compressed air. So it's all dependent on the environment. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Uh, another Question specific uh, from Marilyn, is there a specific method for food packaging manufacturers, environmental testing, such as specific indicator bacteria? Is so that's, that... that's really, really specific to your monitoring plan for your facility. Um, the FDA, at least here in the U.S., definitely looks at ISO 8573 as a good mode of testing for your compressed air. Uh, environmental testing is a little bit different, and then I can totally send you an email later off topic. But, um, yeah, in terms of specific indicator bacteria, that is all specific to the type of facility that you're in. Um, coliforms are going to be around water-based foods. Um, uh, Ready-to-eat meals are all going to have their own specific uh, indicator pathogens. So it's definitely specific to your facility. Okay, uh, a few more questions, Maria. Uh, Daniela, is reporting results in CFU but per plate acceptable? It depends. Uh, what does your monitoring plan require? If you're asking me, if I were your QA officer, I would tell you no. Uh, I want to know your CFU per cubic meter. I want to know in a 1,000 liters how much bacteria, yeast, or mold can I expect to see um, per plate is a very broad uh, unit, but again, it's totally up to your uh, monitoring plan, but ISO 8573-7 requires per cubic meter or 1,000 liters. 
Okay, uh, I think this is a bit of a different question. Rohit, if the count is more than the limit, what can I suggest as a microbiologist to the engineering team? Run away! No, I'm kidding, don't do that. <laughs> um, well, the first thing you want to suggest is take a step back. Let's look at that case study as a really good example. You want to first clean, you want to assume that your method is right. So first you want to clean that point of use. Look at your piping. Is there a biofilm? How, what kind of preventative maintenance do you have for your uh, piping distribution system? Um, what's the humidity around there? Like I said, uh, microorganisms, they love humidity and water content. They need that nu nutrients. Do you have a lot of um, nutrients flying around, right? Are you in a bean sorting plant where there's a lot of dust and stuff floating around? So start with a cleaning procedure. If that doesn't help, look at your sampling method. In this case, with the case study, it was as easy as getting an approved piece of equipment to fix their um, issue, but that may not be the case for you, so it all depends, but definitely start your investigation with cleaning, uh, then look at personnel training, and then look at um, whether or not your piping distribution is good. Okay. Harris, can we use the compressed air sampler in connection to a conveyor? You can use a compressed air uh, impaction sampler with any uh, point of use valve. So basically, uh, sometimes you'll have a female stem or a male quick disconnect. You just need to plug in to the main source of compressed air for your conveyor belt, however you do that. But yeah, it's totally available. You're absolutely able to do it with most appropriate um, pieces of equipment. You just need the, the accessories. Okay, a lot of questions, aren't they, Maria? Uh, Annie, an external laboratory tested our air TMC result on the report said 640 CFU per plate acceptable we don't understand the results as there is no total limit included we have asked but the lab does not answer our question does this make sense so uh i would have said greater than 250 but somebody liked you enough to count all 640 cfus um in terms of understanding there's no total limit right it's not a third party's lab to determine whether or not you have exceeded or met your limit. That limit is dictated by your monitoring plan on your end. So you definitely want to talk to uh, your EHNS or your QAQC department about what to do beyond that. Um, my next thing would be, do you have controls? So if you're, so uh, total mold count, did you have a control? What does your negative control look like? Was that contaminated? So things like that you can look into. Okay. Uh, Pratiwi, is there any minimal standard to take the sample lock, lock based on large? Uh, I'm not sure what the end part is of that question. Does that make sense at all to you, Maria? Uh, well... Is there any minimal standard? The minimum requirement of 8573-7 is a CFU enumeration, so counting the CFUs. Uh, it's not required to do gram stain. It's not required to molecular ID. Uh, but again, that is only to test your compressed air. That may not meet the requirements of your personal monitoring plan, and that may be under the hazardous um, risk taking that your company wants to take your um, critical point, hazardous critical points and such like that. So you just want to be mindful. Yes, there is a minimum, but is the minimum too low for your facility? Okay. Uh, Huna month, blind test and blank test. Same. Are they the same? Yeah. So the blind test, is where you open up the plate and you you do all the physical steps of testing compressed air, but air never touches the surface of the plate. And then you close it. So that's one type of negative control. That's the blind test. That's blind before and blind after. 
The blank is a sterility blank. That plate is never opened. That is testing whether or not there was some sort of, um, whether or not your plates were compromised from the manufacturer of the plate to the distributor of the plate during transit with your postal service in your hands, back to my hands, into the report. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. Ida, is there any limit for mold counts in compressed air? Nope. No limits. Only limits on the blinds and blanks. Am I right to say that this is a big issue for different industries, different product groups, etc., that there are no limits? For compressed air. So yes. So you have to be very specific. There are limits for environmental all day. There are limits for surface all day. But for compressed air, it's not out there yet. So that's why I'm encouraging people, if you're interested in writing to um, – the ISO committee, they're doing their uh, review right now of this protocol. But yeah, it's, it's, it's alarming that it doesn't exist. But at the same time, if you're a facility, you're not pigeonholed into somebody else's limit. So, you know, it's kind of give and take. Mm. And I guess it's different if the compressed air is used where how it's used right. is it used right. on, on food contact surfaces near food etc mm. uh, again uh, okay uh Cla claudia claudia um what other methods besides iso can be used so um this talk was specifically on iso but there um there are other methods out there they have the cam2 right now is the method that I was speaking of earlier that is, I always mix these words up, that is quanti, nope, qualitative, not quantitative. So the CAM2 is a really lightweight piece of equipment. It'll tell you presence or absence. But at the end of the day, you need a control. Every experiment you do, every testing you do, it needs a control. How are you going to know if you have confidence in your plate if you didn't have some sort of control. So that's a requirement. And um, basically the equipment is just going to change based on manufacturing name. But um, Okay. L last, last few questions now because we're going to have to, we will have to end it. VJ, wh why do we need to incubate plates for 10 days? Yeah, I guess it's as good as mine. So <laughs> <laughs> um, as a microbiologist, um, you know that the nutrients in a petri dish is limited and you know that 10 days is kind of excessive when it comes to any incubation. That's why here at Trace, we operate on a two uh, temperature testing. So we do 33 for five days and then 25 for another five days. Um, and what that does is it, it limits that dehydration, but you're absolutely right. 10 to 14 days is quite long. But, you know, playing devil's advocate, you can also see since organ, since a colony, like I talked about, a CFU is a community of hundreds of thousands of single cell bacteria or yeast. So what doesn't pop up on day eight might pop up on day 10. So it's just but, about risk analysis. But I, I, am I right to say that compressed air testing should be an ongoing monitoring thing that you, you don't really looking for quick results to verify this. It, it's more of an ongoing. Absolutely. Long -term. Absolutely. Yeah. Because VJ's next question is very impatient. Is there no quick results we can get? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Michael. Um, Maria, what are your thoughts on MERV rating filters for a compressed air system? Same question for microfilters and active charcoal filters on the air compressor air dryer. So that's not something I'm really familiar with, um, but I will look into it and I'll send you an email back if somebody can get your contact information. Um, I'll definitely look into that and let you know. Okay. Well, we will forward all the questions on to the you, the guys at Trace, and we can pick up on those afterwards. Uh, really, last ones now, Daniela. What organisms are cause for concern if grown on the agar plates after sampling? I mean, it all depends. Um, is your is the plate that you tested like uh, previous 
a person mentioned, is it on a conveyor belt? So do you care if there's um, gram positive organisms on the conveyor belt, but your, but your content is already packaged up and ready to go? Um, or, you know, is it an organism that's being blown into the bag that your loaf of bread is going into, in which case you do care a little bit more? So what types of organisms are a cause for concern? It all depends. Um, definitely the bad ones, the ones that kind of make your, your head spin, right? Salmonella. But there's also different species like E. coli. You have E. coli in your body right now. You're doing just fine. But if you get E. coli 0157, say out of some, you know, lettuce in California, thanks a lot, um, you're going to get sick. So it all depends on your usage of the product, your facility, what you're testing. There's a whole risk assessment that you have to look into when you're asking that question. But if it's um, something that you're, you know, breathing air, maybe all of them are bad. You don't want to get microorganisms in your lungs. So it's all dependent. Super. Right. We're going to leave it there, Maria. In, in fact, we've exhausted the questions. You've done brilliant. Uh, you're, 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 you're an expert oh. on micro, microbes without any doubt. Um, thanks very much for your input today, Maria. Uh, appreciate it on, on my behalf, everybody who's attended today, everybody who watched the recording. So much appreciated for your time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that was great. And you can see the comments in the side by Maria, you know, very good presentation, amazing presentation. So there, there's some great feedback, uh, much uh, well-deserved. Thank you. Right, ladies and gents, um, that was Maria Sandoval, Microbiologist, Trace Analytics, LLC. Um, you will get a copy of the webinar recording, the slides, um, and I've already loaded the certificate in the sidebar. So what about that? Uh, if you do have further questions, the contact details for Maria are, will be on the slide, so you can contact Trace Analytics directly for any technical questions or any help with your um, air, compressed air sampling program, uh, testing program. Brilliant. Uh, so same time next week, we've got um, David Rosenblatt, and we're going to be talking about ISO 22000 2018 that's been issued this year. Uh, yeah, this year. Wow. December the 1st, next uh, tomorrow. Uh, we're almost at the end of the year. Thanks, everybody. And sorry about the technical difficulties at the start, but we persevered, and it was well worth it in the end. Cheers, everyone. Have a, a, a lovely weekend. See you next week. Bye.